Hello again. For the next half an hour, we'll be exploring hidden worlds. No, not the planets of distant galaxies, but the worlds which exist inside each one of us. Now, we usually remain totally unaware of their existence until those odd moments of contact which really make us think, like deja vu, the process of being here before, and maybe a dream which foretells the future, or some other experience which could be classed as paranormal. Now, I can only claim to be an interested observer of this subject, but my first guest has made the most detailed researches into the quest for explanations of these mysteries. And in the process, his own experience has led him to discover a higher being within himself, which can, amongst other things, help to control a troubled mind. He lives and works in Cornwall, and here's Colin Wilson. My other guest is probably better known as an entertainer, but paranormal experiences have been an integral part of his life since childhood, and his unending investigations into the force or forces which move our lives have helped him to cope with great tragedy and have also contributed to the success of his public career as a very funny man. Please welcome Michael Benteen. Gents, it's such a, a big subject and really so little time to talk about it, but um, I would like to get some ground rules, first of all. When we tend to think, if we do think at all about the paranormal, we think of frightening things like uh, ghosts, yeah. poltergeists, uh, Ouija boards, and all of that kind of thing. Um, maybe if I can turn to Colin, first of all. What is your experience of the paranormal? Is it what I've just said? Um, in a sense, but don't forget, I'm totally ESP thick. <laughs> I've never had the slightest sort of psychic ability as Michael has. Uh, on the other hand, when I am totally relaxed or tremendously excited, I discover that my mind will do um, certain peculiar things. I'll give you an example. Years ago, uh, I'd given a particularly good lecture in Los Angeles and I had to meet my family in Disneyland. And it wasn't until I got to Disneyland that I realized that the place is enormous, acre after acre. And I thought, oh my God, I'm just never going to find them. But I was in a good mood because I'd given a good lecture and I was feeling pleased with myself and I thought, relax. And I deliberately relaxed totally and then I let my feet take me to them, which they did in precisely 30 seconds. We went down the road, turned left by some store where they were eating Mexican chihuahuas or whatever those things are called. Chihuahuas? And they're dogs, I think. <laughs> and there was Chilies my, or, yeah. <laughs> and there was my family. And it was because I totally relaxed and what's more, I was confident and it worked. Yeah. yeah. Now, normally, unfortunately, I'm, my mind works too hard to do that, and I, I can't relax enough. Yours are rather more extreme, your experiences, Michael. What do you mean, the Peruvians eat bigger dogs? <laughs> no, they, uh, no, the Mexicans normal. probably do eat yours, actually. <laughs> no, um, uh, I, I'm very like Colin, actually. Uh, if I let rationale interfere with the intuition, uh, then I go wrong. Um, but if I get an intuitive idea, like the flea circus came from nowhere, or the bumblies, or the potties, or all those mad things I used to do in Square World, or the ideas I contributed to the goon show. They came out of left field for no reason at all. Woof, bang, and they were there. And if I then sat down and tried to logicalize them, I logicalized them out of being funny. Because the, the, the creative world is the, inst it's the world of instantaneous thought. You don't come to the conclusion by a logical process. You then say, how the hell am I going to get an 80-foot whale up the River Thames or a Chinese junk to bombard the Houses of Parliament or whatever it is? Then you come to the, the difficult part of translating the idea, which is Id completely idealized, it all happens perfectly, into practical props and make them work. That's the logical part. But that could be uh, just a vivid imagination. We'll come to that later. But, yes, you, but, wait a minute, but, you, but you have been through the classical thing of the moving tables at oh, the yeah. seance, yes. clairvoyance, yes. And, so, and so on, haven't you? Yes, I mean, of course. But when you say vivid imagination, people say, ah, but that's your imagination. And you say, yes, well, where do you buy this imagination? I mean, because everybody's so familiar with it. Do you go down to the grocers and buy two pounds of it? Or do you get a litre and a half because we've now gone to the common market? The answer is that all it is is the ability of the human mind to see images. 
Now, some of those images it creates, others it receives. And that's as it, as it appears to me. All the paranormal is to me is an extension of the normal senses. In other words, you see further, you hear better, you feel deeper. That, that's really what it is. It's the survival senses of man. Now, I mentioned clairvoyance very briefly there, mm. uh, the ability to see the future. Colin, let me put this question to you. How can you predict the future when the future hasn't happened? Ah, uh, you've asked the most difficult of all questions in the whole field of the paranormal, and the one to which I honestly have no answer at all, except to waffle on vaguely about, you know, other dimensions. You see, you can explain almost everything else in terms of these senses which we possess, which simply stretch wider than we realize. Right. And when you relax really deeply, then these senses will, as it were, stretch um, elsewhere, certainly into other places in the world and into the past. You can pick up the vibrations of a house when you walk into it Absolutely. and actually feel things that have happened in the house. All of these things you can explain in these terms. But I must confess that when you get down to this question of the future, it happens again and again and again. I've no doubt whatsoever. Oh. And yet, I cannot even begin to give a ghost of an explanation. Precognitive dreams, those dreams that tell the future? Yeah. What about those? Yeah, well, again, you see, uh, clearly in some sense, time as we understand it is an illusion. Yeah. We're fixed in it because we're stuck on it like a train on railway lines. And yet the fact is the railway lines are already there stretching into the future. Or like the rest of a gramophone record when the head is on it. Um, it's, it's there waiting to be played in some sense. And yet that appears to mean that we're predestined to do certain things. And I don't mean that at all. And neither do I believe that for a moment. Do you believe that, Michael? No, Dunn said in his book, An Experiment with Time, which was written about 1929, something like that, that if um, uh, free will and predestination coexist, the future is no longer the future. Because if A dreams that he's going to murder B, and he can't stand the thought, so commits suicide, which is the predestined end? Is it that he should commit suicide or that he's been thwarted in the predestination of killing, killing, uh, killing B? It's a very good book in terms of the relative appreciation of time. There was a wonderful joke about Einstein years ago. There were two men arguing about Einstein. One says, what does Einstein do? And he says, well, Einstein has a theory called relativity. He said, what does that mean? He says, well, you've got a boil on your knee and a second seems to pass for an hour got a pretty girl on your knee and an hour's passing like a second <laughs> and the other guy says from this Einstein's making a living <laughs> which is a wonderful thought but it is it's the relative position yes. that you occupy uh, when you observe the event in other words when you're in the sleep state you're divorced from time the theory that they had for some years that the knock on the door between two knocks on the door you can you can live a week in a dream and they thought that that wasn't so that it, it actually you dreamt within the real time as they called it but the real time is the illusion the dream time is the one in which you're relative to time and space but, you move anywhere any place but going back to predestination again i mean how many times do people look back over their life and and look at the things that have happened i mean we all do this i've mm. done it and you say well that happened and that led to that mm. really it's all part of a plan and we put we put things into some sort of plan of life now if the plan exists in the past why shouldn't it exist in the future? This is not so, you know. No. It's, it's just not true. You know, J.B. Priestley had an extremely interesting story in his book on time. A woman dreamt quite clearly um, that she went down by a stream uh, with her baby when she was camping, um, put the baby down and fiddled around with the soap, and then went back to get something else and found that the baby had drowned when she got back. Two months later, she recognized as she was about to put the baby down that she was in the same dream situation, and so she tucked the baby under her arm and went back to the tent to get whatever it was. And so she'd actually changed the future by knowing about it. Now, I'm convinced that this is true. Mm. You can have these peculiar dreams of the future, and yet the future is not fixed in that precise and absolute way. You can change it. We have free will. It's rather like standing between two mirrors. If you stand between two mirrors, you see an infinity of your own image. But if you could imagine that image number six is slightly further forward, or image number seven is slightly further back, or image number eight is scratching itself, or image number nine is picking its nose, or whatever it is, that it's still the probability pattern of your being there. It's a question of which action you are going to do is determined by what you do now. But we still don't know why we had that dream, or why... No, we don't. Uh, ...or this woman had this dream in the you know, first place. Um, I tell you, there's an interesting theory about this, and this theory briefly says, um, we know vaguely from Freud that we possess an ordinary conscious mind and we apparently possess what you might call a subconscious basement. Now, what has been suggested is that we not only possess a subconscious basement which can 
that contains all our deeper instincts and nastier ideas and feelings, but also a subconscious attic, or rather a superconscious yeah. attic, which is up above the ordinary mind, and which appears to possess powers which we do not normally possess except in these certain moments of great intensity when for some reason there is a contact established between you and what you might call your higher self. Now, I agree that sounds absurd, but more and more over the 20 years in which I've been studying and writing about this subject, I've come to believe this is true. We possess a superconscious yeah. higher self. Is this your faculty X that you talk about, yeah. where we have these blinding flashes of meaning about life? Not quite, no. Faculty X is much more simple. Um, faculty X is that sudden feeling that another time or another place is absolutely real to you as you're sitting here. If Chesterton says, um, we say thank you when someone passes the salt, but we don't mean it. We say the Earth is round, but we don't mean it. Mm. But an astronaut in space could say the Earth is round and mean it. Mm. And mm. when in those certain moments you suddenly say something and mean it because you feel it deeply to be true, that's faculty X, and we've got this faculty inside the brain the whole time. Well, things like, uh, for example, we live with an, with an illusion that we've created ourselves, but we navigate by it. I mean, people say, thank God we've just passed the 49th parallel. Show me it in the ground. I mean, where is it? Is it a huge line drawn there? It's a gratic, it's a series of gratic, uh, literally um, uh, a graph that we've laid over the earth. But we navigate by it. We, uh, we have a time zone by it. But you can actually feel it if you pass over a line of force. For instance, the dowser. Dowsing is, is, uh, can be performed by any child. It's a very contentious force as far as science is concerned because science as yet hasn't come up with a good dowsing device. It's got a primitive one. The gas board have it and you'll be delighted to hear <laughs> it spikes through a welly boot. And then it comes up in a series, because I've seen it with this Herbert using yeah. it. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. But it's a primitive doubt. He said, well, you see, what we do is we can detect the presence of the gas pipe underneath the surface of the earth. I said, but George does that. He said, ah, George does it much better, but we've got the boots now, so we can actually <laughs> check it, you see. But the child can do it. I took uh, four children and did it on television. I'd never seen them before. Two boys, two girls, they're about 11 years old. I showed them how to douse with the, the rods, and we had laid uh, a serpentine path of a hose pipe about a foot below the surface of a, pl of, um, uh, a broken field in a, a nursery near Reading. Now, I hadn't seen where the, the pipe was. I saw where the water went in, I saw where the water went out. We gave the kids the dousing rods, I gave them three minutes instruction on telly, and one kid went over and laid these little windmills we'd given them, given them six windmills each. He stuck them in a straight line over there. The others stuck all theirs in a serpentine line, which we then pulled up, the hose pipe underneath and it came up under each one of the windmills mm. and I said isn't it extraordinary three of the children got it right but the little boy put his in six in a straight line over there and the nurseryman's back to the subject in hand and uh, I was talking in the beginning Colin about how you managed to get control of your inner self by calling upon this higher being oh. it, it's um, it sounds a very difficult concept but you have this uh, idea of a ladder of selves within each one of us C could you explain that briefly is that possible well what happened simply was that in 1973 when I was being tremendously overworked I began to wake up in the middle of the night having panic attacks. My heart would beat faster and faster until I was terrified that it would go too fast and stop. Uh, the first night it happened, I thought I was having a heart attack. Uh, by the second or the third night, I'd learned to control it slightly. And what I actually did was, when this sort of heart beating and terror started, um, I did my best, as it were, to project myself up above it like a schoolmistress going into a room full of quarrelling children, sort of doing this. And as soon as I managed to do that, as soon as I got myself fully awake and above it, it instantly subsided. Now, I realized that what I'd done, in a sense, was call upon a higher Colin Wilson, so to speak, who put these jangling, stupid selves who were quarreling into their proper place. And then I began to study cases of multiple personality, in which people simply turn into dozens of different people. And... Again, I ask the question, how can this possibly happen unless they're being possessed by spirits? But I concluded finally that the answer is that we all possess inside ourselves dozens of different personalities, but they're arranged like a ladder. And what's more, a ladder with sloping sides, not ordinary straight sides, so that the higher you climb, the more 
uh, you have to compress yourself, so to speak, and make a tremendous effort. It's terribly easy to fall down the ladder, as I had when I got into these panic attacks about overwork. You just think, oh my God, and down you go, boink, to a lower level. It's incredibly difficult to compress yourself and climb up to the next step. And then it struck me that these are the levels of personality that happen in cases of multiple personality, and that this is the answer to the whole problem. But this is what, is this what happens when uh, somebody is in a state and somebody else says, pull yourself together. Yeah, yeah. Precisely. Yes, y you also think of the number of uh, murderers, especially uh, sex, uh, sex attacks on women or children, who say, something made me do it. There is a level of the human mind. I saw it when I walked into Belson. I was uh, 20, 23 years old, and I walked into the face of hell. I've never seen anything so terrifying in my entire life. And uh, we liberated it. And I, I was down the road on an RAF airfield, an advanced airfield we just brought in. I'd just flown in and uh, in the comm flight. And I went up as a jock doctor, said, for God's sake, come up the road. If you've got any idea of, of first aid, anything, bring all the chocolate, anything. And I didn't know what to expect. I just thought it'd be a prison camp for maybe some of my blokes there. And uh, what we saw was uh, the, the, the sub-bestial level of man. And it is interesting that today, no animal can cross the compound at Belson. Uh, no bee flies over it. No worms live in it. No, no creature at all lives in the compound of Belson. Because buried there are these victims of terror. And the Lama said to a friend of mine, a Tibetan Lama said a very wise thing to a friend of mine who was a teaching psychiatrist. He said, all the demons and all the angels are inside us and it's entirely up to us how they manifest they manifest as a reflection of our own personality at different levels of bestiality atavistic behavior a spirituality a higher higher sense of consciousness i, I agree entirely that's ex that's exactly how i see it um, and that the, the, the mass of the supraconscious is the collective unconscious uh, that uh, uh, Carl Gustav Jung... Now, no, hang on. The collective unconscious, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's what I call the overmind is the supraconscious and the universal overmind is the sum total of everybody's overmind. That's the source, the data bank, if you like, which you plug into and from which you get these flashes. So it's beyond time. It, it's completely overseeing time and space. Space and time, which are one anyway, are so inter, inter, interrelated with consciousness that you can view it from any angle. It's exactly like the isometric possession, uh, projection on, a, on a, a, a computer. But is this overmind something that we can draw upon in our current yes, state, our current yes, manifestation? Yes, absolutely. How do we do that? Well, <laughs> by raising your state of consciousness. <laughs> by focusing intently. Yes. Absolutely. But you see, what Michael was talking about there in Belson is um, a, a slightly different thing. It appears to be some kind of tape recording. T.C. Yes. Lethbridge was convinced that the electrical field of water is basically responsible for most of what we call ghosts. Oh. That what has happened is that some strong emotion has taken place in a certain spot that is recorded just as an ordinary magnetic tape and that people who are sensitive, like dowsers, can go into that place and they can actually appear to see the ghost. Um, this is what Michael calls objective clairvoyance, when you really think it's outside you. Mm. Now, according to Lethbridge, what happens is simply that the electrical field of the water somehow picks up these things, and in a place like Belson, mm. which I imagine would be sort of fairly damp, mm. yes, uh, you, would, you would actually... Would. The horror... Exp yes, precisely. Absolutely. The horror felt by these people would have imprinted itself as if on a magnetic tape. On the other hand, if it had been a totally dry place in the middle of the desert, there would probably have been far, far less of this. Mm. Picking up what you've just been saying, that we can actually use this overmind to our own advantage at the moment by raising our level of consciousness. That's right. How do we do that? Well, like Purely concentration? Well, a like composer does it. For, ex uh, for example, the artist. The artist doesn't go, oh, I'm going to paint a picture. He opens his mind and he says, I want to paint a picture. Mm. And all sorts of things go through him. He's tuning in. He's tuning. It's like uh, Bonarotti uh, walking into the quarry uh, and saying to the two men, look, that piece of rock over there, that's my pieta. They say, it's a piece of rock. He says, no, that's my pieta. Oh, that's my pieta. You see. <laughs> and then they cut the piece of rock with the wedges yeah. and, and sliced it out. And sure enough, with only a few strokes, the outline of the, pi of the uh, pieta started to appear. I know we haven't got enough time for this question, but I must ask it to you. What then is the meaning of life? Why are we here? It's the eternal question which everybody thinks about, you know, when, when you're young, you think, what is the meaning of life? And two o'clock in the morning at college, over cups of black coffee, you're yes. busily discussing the meaning of life. But, I mean, what is your conclusion as to why we're here? Yes. What's it all for? To live it. Not to live it. To live it.
purely that. You live it to the full. You live it with the experience. You come in as a completely blank tape. You go out. And in the last... I have actually died twice and come back. And I felt myself leave my body. I felt myself go somewhere. It was infinitely vast. It was infinitely awe-inspiring. And then I felt myself being pulled back. And I woke up inside my body on a hospital bed in a great deal of pain. Reluctantly, I may add. Mm. Uh, to control it, as I see it, basically, we appear to have these two sides of the mind. One of them, as you say, tries to think what is the meaning of life. There's another side that knows deeply and instinctively. St. Augustine said, when I, I ask myself what is time, I don't know the answer. Um, when I let myself relax, I suddenly know it. Yeah. And this is true. Somehow we've got to get these two sides of the mind together, and when they come together, we know the answer. But we, I still can't feel the answer. I mean, religion might give me the answer. It says I'm here to go to heaven. No, but you have to find the answer yourself. And the answer is that if we don't collectively find the answer very soon, we're not going to be a human race left. There won't be a human race left, we'll have blown ourselves off it, no. because logic has taken over from intuition. You see, that, that sounds to me though a gloomy sort of conclusion, when what I'm saying is, once you know that it's inside you, you know the game you used to play as children, where you let yourself fall backwards into somebody's arms, yes. you've got another person inside you who will catch you, yes. if you let yourself fall backwards. And this, in a way, is the basic solution. This other person mm. inside us. About almost the last sentence in, in your book is that paranormal powers are already fully evolved and are just waiting for us to use them. Yes. That, yes. Completely. But, Every child has them. But most of us don't know how to do it. Well, go back to what uh, Dwarz has been said in practice. Every, every religion has had a prophet. If you take the great prophet Jesus, let's take, he says, go back to thinking like a child. Chuck all the garbage away, go back to... And you'll get the answer every time. Are you any way along the way, Colin, to actually finally getting more paranormal powers yourself? What I'm learning is to relax, yes. which is basically the answer to it. Yes. I don't know how to relax very well, I don't do it very well, but when I can do it, I know the answers. Maybe there's um, a message there for us all. I've found it an absolutely fascinating conversation, and uh, it's certainly reading your books on the subject given me an awful lot of food for thought, and, dare I say, it may even have changed the way I think about life, which is certainly something, and maybe this conversation has helped as well. Thank you very much indeed uh, to Colin Wilson and also to Michael Benteen for that fascinating conversation, and we hope that you found it uh, fascinating as well, and we hope that you've enjoyed the whole series, because that is the end of this series of That Chat Show. We'll see you sometime in the future. Till then, goodbye. The search for the meaning of life. To answer the riddles of the mind. To define existence. Such are the goals of the philosopher and the quest of an existentialist. Author Colin Wilson has explored life, mind, and consciousness in over 60 books, including The Outsider, The Occult, and The Mind Parasites. A resident of Cornwall, England, Colin Wilson's most recent works are two novels, The Personality Surgeon and The Psychic Detectives. For the past five million years, um, during which um, man has been evolving on the earth, he has basically been a passive creature who's regarded himself as a creature of his environment. He gets used to being bullied and pushed around and so on by the environment. What he's discovered little by little over the past two or three thousand years is that his mind can change that environment to a tremendous extent, but in another sense he has not caught up with this recognition. I began to discover that in fact there are methods of doing this. So for example, intense concentration even for a fairly short period, if you can stay really concentrated, even for 10 minutes, you often push your mind up to a higher level of intensity and it will lock and stay there. This is like the mind when you're in a state of boredom. The moment someone says, listen, the first thing you do is to pull all the marbles together into the center of the table. And if you get really deeply interested in something, the marbles not only are pulled together into a single group in the center of the table, they begin to climb on top of one another. And if, when you're really concentrated, they climb on top of one another to form a kind of pyramid. And of course, when you let go, the pyramid scatters again and the marbles go all over the table. But it is precisely like that with the mind. 
Now, when you get depressed, you let yourself, as it were, scatter, become diffused. And the question is to simply get into that habit, not merely of pulling the marbles into one single circle, but making them go into a second and a third until they form a pyramid. And you can do it by simply going into these states of intense concentration. Psychometry. The ability to see into people's lives and events through objects is the basis of philosopher Colin Wilson's novel, The Psychic Detectives. What I found fascinating me about the um, field of psychometry was that as soon as you began to study uh, what seems to be the most easily verifiable part of it, that is that we all possess this odd faculty to pick up things uh, from objects, which is in a way allied to the faculty of dowsing, you immediately began to see that it was connected to other things that were quite close to it, uh, for example to telepathy. Of course, one of the most interesting aspects of psychometry um, is the ability of people like Peter Herkos to help to solve crimes using this, to be able, let's say, to hold a weapon and to say something about the person who used it. Uh, this is true, it does work. There are many cases of, you know, that Herkos